Dear Heavenly Father, God, we want to invite you into this place. Lord, we come before you saying thank you before we ask you for anything. For God, you didn't have to wake us up this morning. You didn't have to give us breath. You didn't have to allow us to make it here safely, but you did. And so we say thank you. And now, Father God, as we prepare to hear a word from you, may your Holy Spirit fill this place. May you be seen here and heard here and felt here today, Father God. May you and you alone be the only thing that matters. God, we love you, we praise you, and I ask that you will hide me behind the cross, that it may not be Kimberly that is seen, but Christ that is heard. We praise your name in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna talk today about one of my favorite parables. It is the story of the sower and the seed. Everybody know that one? Okay, let me try that again. Does everybody know that one? Okay, good. Now the story is found in Matthew um, and we're going to go to chapter 15. Oops, sorry, sorry, Luke, sorry. All right, so we're going to go to Luke, and we're going to go to chapter 8. And we're going to start with verse 4. And it says, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, And it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And when he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, we hear this parable quite often. Actually, I've heard it quite often growing up. The parable of the sower and the seed. And when the disciples ask Jesus to explain this parable, he he goes in to talk about the gospel and that the the seed that's sown is the gospel of Jesus and some of it fell on bad soil and some of it fell to produce this great crop. Growing up, I always loved the little song that went with it, the soul sow some seed, and and I just love the story. But as I started reading a little, God started to challenge me with the parable. See, oftentimes when we read the Bible, and I talked about this last night, we like to read as the story of the hero. When we read biblical concepts like David and Goliath, we want to be David, not Goliath. When when we read these these concepts like Moses and Pharaoh, we want to be Moses. We're Moses, not Pharaoh. We like to be the the dispenser of good and, and of greatness when we read these Bible stories. But God has started to challenge me to look at things with a little bit of a different lens. So if you'll just use your holy imagination with me today, I want you to flip the story around just a little bit. So there's this this sower, this farmer, and he's got this, this, this maybe basket of seed. And he decides he's going to go out and spread some seed. 
So he, he goes out and he's got a handful of this, this good seed. He throws it out. And some of that seed lands on the side of the road and it gets trampled under people's feet because people aren't really paying attention to the fact that there's seed there. Maybe it gets thrown onto a road or, or onto a sidewalk or onto a place where there's lots of things going on. So he, he throws some more seed out and the birds see a tasty, delicious treat. So before the seed can even get into the soil, it's eaten by birds. He throws some more seed out. And, and this seed doesn't even get a chance to grow because it never actually plants roots. So it dies when the sun comes out and it's hot. So because there are no roots, it can't get any moisture to water it, to nurture it. And then there's some seed that he throws it out and some weeds come up, it's growing, it's trying really hard, and it gets choked out. And then there's some seed that falls on that good soil, and it grows, and it produces more, more than that one little seed could ever think. Well, in this story, we like to be who? The farmer, of course. We're the ones going out and dispensing the gospel of Jesus, telling everyone how good God is and how wonderful church is and, and, and look at all the blessings that God is doing and we're throwing out the gospel, we're throwing out the seed, expecting it to produce good fruit. And some people listen and receive it and some people don't. That's all great. But what if, what if in this story, we're not the farmer, what if we're the seed? What if we're not the farmer? What if we're not the one dispensing this wonderful gospel? What if we are the gospel? What if you're the seed? Now, let's look again at this parable from the perspective of us being the seed and God being the farmer. So God's got you in his pocket. He picks you up and he pours you out into the world. Which seed are you? Which place are you in the parable? Maybe, maybe you're the seed that got thrown onto the wayside. Maybe you're the seed that got trampled underfoot. There's lots of distractions. There's lots going on. And maybe God has called you to do something or to be somewhere where, where there's a lot going on, but you're getting trampled. You're getting walked over. Maybe, maybe God has put you in a place and, and maybe you feel a little bit like prey, that the birds are kind of circling around you at work, the birds are kind of circling around you at home, those birds may be your children, ready to pick you and pluck you up. What do you do if you're the seed and not the farmer? So my single message to you today is, grow where you're planted. See, most of us, if we're the seed, we want to be the ones that have been thrown in the good soil so that we can grow. But the, 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 the more likely situation is that most of us have been thrown in some really tough situations. Most of us didn't grow up in good soil. Most of us have been thrown on the wayside and trampled underfoot. Many of us are in situations where we feel like the birds of, of sin and temptation and heartache and pain are just circling around us ready to eat us up. 
But the challenge here is to grow where you're planted. See, the thing about a seed is that a seed contains everything necessary for it to mature. Within the seed is already the baby plant that is ready to grow to maturity. It's already inside of you. But we sometimes underestimate what God has put inside of us. See, the Bible says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So if greater is God than who is inside of me, then what's in the world? That means that no matter where I get placed, no matter what cards I've been dealt, no matter what has come upon me or where I find myself, I've been commanded to grow. So what if your circumstances and your situations don't look ideal? You've got greater inside of you. So you grow where you're planted. So my question to you is, which seed are you in the story? Do you feel like you're the seed that's being trampled on? Or, or, or maybe, maybe you feel like the seed that was thrown in rocky places and the sun scorched it. The, the brightness, the hotness of the sun choked out and, and scorched that seed. So my question to you is, what's burning you? What's burning you? What is keeping you from growing where God has placed you? Is it a job? Is it a lack of resources? Maybe it's fear. What is it that is burning out the desire that God has placed in you to grow? Every time you get ignited by something, every time God puts a word in your heart, it gets blown out. Why does, why does that happen? If you look a little deeper in the story, it tells us, see, some of the seed was placed in a place that never grew roots. And because it never grew roots, it was never able to get the moisture that it needed to sustain it on the inside. So it was dry. And many of us are really dry seeds. We're really dry on the inside. And it shows because when we show up on Sabbath morning, we look dry. We don't smile. We don't say hello. We all look angry. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. <laughs> Where is the moisture inside of you? God tells us that we have access to his Holy Spirit, which is a well that will never run dry. So if we have access to the well of God, why are we dry Christians? Where is the overpouring of the Holy Spirit? Where is the love of God inside of us? What's drying out your seed? Where are your roots? See, what happens a lot of times is when we come into the church when, or we have been raised in the church, a lot of times we have false roots. We, we have temporary roots. Anybody, anybody garden in here? Anybody ever, anybody garden? No, some people? Okay, anybody ever seen a seed before? Let's start there. Okay, okay, so we can go from there. So when you have a, a, a little baby seed or a baby plant, a lot of times the roots are very small and thin. So when you're putting that plant into a garden, you've gotta be very gentle with the roots. As you place it, you've gotta make sure that you put it in good soil. And if as you're moving it, you damage those roots or you don't give it the right stuff that it needs to grow, 
Those roots will never take hold in that soil and that plant will die. And many of us have been in the church so long that we really think we have roots when we don't. We've got roots in tradition. Oh, we know how to keep the 28 fundamental beliefs. And if they add a 29th, we'll keep that one too. We, we know how to do all the right things. We know how to turn the, 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 the television off and the, the things off for Sabbath. We, we know how to get nice and dressed up for church. We know how, how to plant our roots in what looks like Jesus and what talks like Jesus. But are we really rooted in the gospel of Jesus? Or are we rooted in tradition and church? Because let me tell you, when we get to heaven, there won't be a bunch of churches. There will be one worship service. So if, you're, if your roots are planted in what church should look like, if, if your roots are planted in your, in your conveniences, you're going to have a really hard time being transposed into the heavenly kingdom. Because it's not going to look like kind of what we made God and church to look like down here. So where are your roots? And the thing about roots is that we've made them so complicated. Roots aren't complicated. Roots are direct connections to the life source for the plant. So what's your direct connection? It's Jesus. Jesus. He says, I am the true vine. A vine is like a root above ground. He says, I am the true vine. I am your root. So when we get connected to Jesus, we're connected to the life source. Are you connected to Jesus? And when I ask, are you connected to Jesus, I'm not asking, are you connected to a Sabbath school? Or, or are you connected to a conference? Or do you pay your tithe on time? Or do you always make sure that you, you look the part? No, I'm asking, are you connected to Jesus? Does your Bible have dust on it? Are you connected to Jesus? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Do you check your emails? Do you check in with Jesus? Where our roots begin. They begin with our connection with Christ. And somewhere from, from doing coloring pages on the floor during church and sitting in the pews paying attention, we've lost the simplicity of connecting with Jesus. Sometimes you've just got to say, not, oh, oh, Father God, thou greatest in heaven, oh, heavenly Father. No, sometimes you've just got to say, Daddy, Daddy, I need you. Daddy, I'm struggling. Man, God, this day really sucks. God is God enough to handle your stuff and still be God. Our mess, our sin, our sin is too messy for God to get involved in. So plant your roots in him, even if it's a little dirty. If God was afraid of mess, he wouldn't have sent his son. So maybe you're the trampled seed. Maybe the birds of prey are swirling around you. Maybe, maybe the sun has scorched out that thing that God has put in you. Maybe the thorns have been choking out your seed. What are thorns? See, one of my favorite flowers is a rose. I love roses. Any rose lovers in here? Okay, for all the women who raise their hands, guys, pay, pay attention. Husbands, take notes if you've forgotten. 
One of the things I love about roses is that they're beautiful. But if you've ever grabbed a rose at the wrong angle, you will get poked. And the right thorn could even cause you to bleed. Beautiful to look at, hard to get close to. Are you a rose or are you the thorns? See, many of us, like I said, we, we want to be the hero in the story, but many times we're the thorn choking out somebody else's seed with how we look at them, how we talk to people, that if it doesn't look Adventist or sound Adventist or smell Adventist, you can stay over there and I'll stay over here and we'll be okay. But the Bible says that God came both for the Jew and the Gentile. God said that I'm, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. He wants us to get rid of the thorns in our lives. Don't be a thorn. Don't be what keeps people from coming in those doors. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? And if it's been a while, why? We want to be a place where anybody can come and poked or choked. The seed. And some of us, maybe we're not the thorn, but maybe we've got thorns in our life. Maybe something is you. What is it? What's causing your spiritual life to be mediocre? What's causing you to spend five minutes every day instead of 15? Is it busyness? Is it anger? And I talked about this last night with the young people. Many of us are really, really, really mad at God, but we don't admit it because that's not the thing to do. We have to, you know, look the part, right, Pastor Mark? We've got to look good. We've got to look nice. We can't really have issues. Who has issues? Who's, who's struggling? I'm not struggling. I'm good. I'm fantastic. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm wonderful in the name of Jesus. When the truth of the matter is, is that many of us are struggling with depression, with bitterness. God let us down 20 years ago and we still haven't let it go. We're mad at our parents or our grandparents. We're frustrated, we're angry, we're upset, and every time the Holy Spirit tries to plant something in your life, it gets choked out by your fear. It gets choked out by your expectations of what God is supposed to look like, how the word is supposed to be delivered, what family is supposed to look like. And even if it doesn't look that way, even if it's not pretty, I want to challenge you to whatever those weeds are in your life that are choking out the life inside of you, that are choking out the Spirit of God, to ask Jesus to bring you some weed killer, some Roundup, and spray it all over your mind. The Bible tells us to take every thought captive and make it submit to Christ. So when those weeds start to come in your mind that say you can't do it, you can't start a business, you, you, you can't quit smoking, you can't quit drinking, you can't be a good father, you can't be a good mother. You have to take that thought captive, literally in your mind, say, stop it, Satan, get thee behind me. And you take that thought and you bring it in front of Jesus. 
If you have to mentally imagine those thoughts of depression and hatred and anger and the word that says, the, the word take it captive literally means to take something by force aggressively and on purpose. It's a decision we have to make to submit our thoughts and our mind to Christ. So we take our thoughts captive so that the weeds don't get to choke out the Spirit of God inside of us. So spray some weed killer on those thoughts. But then the Bible says that there's some seed that lands on good soil. And that that seed bears fruit that multiplies greater than what the seed was originally capable of. And sometimes we believe that God is only doing things in our life for us. But the truth of the matter is, is that when God plants you as the seed, you are required to grow. That's the only job of a seed. The seed has no other job but to grow but to become whatever that seed is supposed to become. So your job as the seed is to grow where you're planted. But how do you know if you're growing? What does a growing seed look like? Well, that's real easy. It produces fruit. When a seed is growing, you can see the results of that growth on the plant. So for those who've been in the church a long time, where's your fruit? Where's your fruit? And if you're wondering what the fruit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, mercy, long-suffering, So if you've been planted in Christ, and if you're doing your job as a seed, if you're growing, then you're producing fruit. That means you're getting a little more patient with people. That means you're, you're becoming a little bit more kind. That, that means you're a little bit more loving today than you were a year ago. And you know, it's so funny, it's so funny that um, in our generation and in society, we've kind of got this mindset that we really don't need church, that kind of church is optional. And now with technology, we really don't even have to go to church to be at church. We can watch church on TV in our pajamas with our Milo. Thank you for introducing me to Milo. My life has been forever changed. But we really don't have to actually exert ourselves to be in the presence of church and, and to fellowship. We don't have to. But here's the thing. How would you ever know that you're growing if you're not placed in a garden? God created us to move and work in communities. Because how will you ever know that you have a temper issue if God doesn't put you around people who get on your nerves? How, how would you ever know that, that you have a, a shortage of love fruit in your life if God didn't put you around people who you couldn't stand sometimes? How, how would you know that you struggle with mercy if God didn't put you around people who keep messing up? And a lot of times we, we want to pray these people out of our lives. Lord, if you would just please take sister so-and-so and transfer her membership to another church. Lord, please, I will praise you. I will pay double tithe if she would just stay home this Sabbath. Lord, please. And we can't get rid of them. But why is that? It's because they're the fertilizer. They're the, the, yeah, the irony in that is really hilarious. <laughs> They're the fertilizer. They're the stinky stuff that God puts in your life that 
nourishes you and helps you to grow. It helps you to produce more fruit when you realize where your fruit is lacking. So that person in your life who's getting on your nerves, they may be the person who you're married to, love them and love them and love them some more. And the person who drives you crazy, forgive them and forgive them and forgive them some more. And the boss who is relentless, Pray for them, and pray for them, and pray for them some more. And when your thoughts say, I can't do this, I'm not cut out for this, take those thoughts captive and make them submit to Christ so that you can grow where you're planted. Grow where you're planted. So you've used your holy imagination with me. We've kind of walked through the story. What seed are you? Where are you? What are you struggling with? What's choking out your praise? What keeps you from worshiping God Sunday through Saturday instead of Friday night through Saturday? Are you having trouble growing where you're planted? Maybe you need to look around. Are there birds of temptation and and sin and, and hurt kind of hovering over you, just waiting to pluck you out? Maybe you need some weed killer in your life. Maybe your roots need to be planted just a little deeper. Maybe you need to stay on your knees just a little longer. Maybe, maybe, maybe we need to put our electronics away and pick up our actual Bible, the one with pages that turn. Hey, that's a good seed. You know what's funny? Maybe, maybe we need that childlike faith, that fearlessness to believe God when he says that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think or imagine. So why aren't we imagining greatness for our lives? Why aren't we imagining greatness for our church? Why aren't we imagining greatness for our spiritual lives? Could it be that we put ourselves in the position of the farmer? That we made ourselves God of the gospel? Maybe we need to come down a little bit and be the seed. Grow where God has planted you. It might not be easy. And you know what, if it is, if it is a little too easy, it's probably not God. It might be tough to grow. It might be difficult to be a Christian in an environment where Christianity is the unpopular thing to do. It may be difficult to to grow in a place where everybody around you is doing the wrong thing and you're trying to do the God thing. It may be difficult to grow when you feel like you've heard every sermon, you've sang every praise and worship song 50 billion times, you've sat in the same seat in the pew for 50 years. Maybe you need to be refreshed. Maybe you need the Holy Spirit to rain down on you with the latter rain and water your soul in a way that you haven't been watered in years. And if in your mind you're thinking, that's not me, I'm good. 
When was the last time you left church and actually did what the sermon talked about? When was the last time that you, you got a message from the Lord or you had a scripture that just was awesome and you shared it on Facebook instead of updating your status? When was the last time you had family worship? One of my favorite songs says, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord standing in the need of prayer standing in the need of grace standing in the need of mercy standing in the need of a savior because here's what God does no matter where you've been planted God can make bad soil into good soil God can take your situation and work it in such a way that it becomes your blessing instead of your curse. When we understand what salvation is about, Revelation says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Now many of us have accepted Jesus into our life. We've got the blood, but where's your testimony? Where's your seed? Where's your fruit? That's the second part. Sometimes we stay so quiet about what we're going through. Somebody needs to know that you overcame. Somebody needs to know that you got planted in some mess and you grew anyway. Somebody needs to know that you're an overcomer. For the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. So when was the last time you conquered? When was the last time you shared your victory? And if it's been that long, it's time for another victory. These kids... These little ones, they need to know that mommy and daddy and, and pastor and elder aren't perfect and weren't perfect, but they had a savior who brought them out, who delivered them. And we've created a culture that's very unpopular to say, hey, I used to be. But guess what? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. That's amazing grace. Amazing grace. So to all my seeds in the audience, I wanna give you a challenge. Where have you been planted? you to think about it and now I want to challenge you to grow grow in spite of the heartache grow in spite of the challenges grow in spite of the difficulty grow in spite of the very stinky fertilizer that may be around you I want to challenge you to grow I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes If you need to grow, and I want you to be very honest with yourself. This is not about anybody else. This is about your relationship with God. If you need to grow where you've been planted, I want you to stand up on your feet. If you want to say to God today, God, help me to grow where you've placed me. If you know there's an area in your life that you need to surrender to God, I want you to stand up on your feet. Now maybe you've been growing, maybe you've, you've been trying to do your best. 
But now it's time to see the fruit. You're saying, God, help me to produce fruit. Help me to be more patient, more kind, more loving, more long-suffering. You can stand up too. And if it's your desire, I would love to pray for you. And if you would like special prayer, I would love for you to come down front. And let's pray together as seeds in the garden of God. If you want special prayer, come down now. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will speak to you and speak through you. And if at any point during the prayer you want to come down, come on down. Sometimes you've got to get close to Jesus. And say, Lord, I can't do it on my own. But I need you. I need a savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just want to say thank you for being God. If you never do another thing, you've done more than enough. God, we thank you for loving us enough to send your son into this mess called humanity and die on the cross for the very people who would wake up every morning and forget about you. God, we say thank you. And Lord, you have put inside of us everything we need to be the walking, talking, breathing, living gospel of Jesus. So, Lord, give us the power to grow where we are planted. Give us the courage, Father God, to push past the, 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 the roots that are choking us, the weeds, the thorns, the sun. God, will you please shower us with your latter rain? Water us afresh, Father God. Create in us a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. God, we need you. We can't do it on our own. Our thoughts get in the way. Distractions get in the way. Birds circle around us, Father God. But Lord... You said that we're more than conquerors. You said that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think or imagine. So help us to believe you and live like it. Thank you, Father God, for this body of believers, this basket of seeds. God, we're not perfect, we're messed up, we're full of sin. But you want to use us anyway. So God, help us to be willing vessels. God, I pray a prayer of covering over all the families and the children and the pastors and the leaders here, Father God. That your Holy Spirit may fall in this place and this church may see growth like never before. May people from the community and the streets just walk in the door saying, I heard there was fruit here. And God, may this place be preparation for heaven where there won't be a bunch of churches but one worship and one God and one praise. Thank you in advance. We worship you. We thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name, God. We praise your name, God. We love you. Amen.